Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 189, Underused Board Game Themes. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live is the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch. So tonight we've got a question from our newest Patreon patron that's going to have us talking about underused themes in board games. After that, we're reviewing a game with a theme I've never personally seen before, Door Knockers. That's Aldabas, Doors of Cartagena from Grand Gamers Guild. We've even got a uniquely themed game in our Week in Review where I'm going to be sharing my first thoughts on Mountains Out of Mole Hills. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. It's been a quiet week this past week, so not a lot to cover today. But let's start off with some comments on our Games for Douglas Adams fans topic from last week. A patron of the show, Jeff Seuss, has some game suggestions. Paranoia, obviously. Less obviously, Fiasco. And the replayability is great with all of these sci-fi playsets at fiascoplaysets.com genre sci-fi. And for a board game, you just throw in Cosmic Encounter on the table for a silly sci-fi game. Some great suggestions there, Jeff. Also good to include some RPGs. We stuck to board games on our show. And I'll do what I usually do and throw those in the show notes. Now, David Collins comments, The Captain is Dead is a really fun game. I was playing it when I was on Game Crafter before EG got it. Four or five is a good player count. With more, it gets tougher as the event deck deplete, depletes faster, getting closer to the critical red alerts. Yeah, this is one I really need to try. Now, I played Space Cadets a number of times, which is meant to be a Starfleet bridge simulator game. And it's a bunch of little micro games and it's very tactical and you're planning things out and trying to do science probes. And I want Fast Furious fun. I, I want the bridge on fire and the captain's dead. And what do we do? And I think I'm going to get that more out of the captain is dead than I ever did out of the other games. So I am really curious to try that one. If anyone Windsor's got a copy, bring it out the next time we're out gaming. All right. Well, and finally, Mark C says, thank you, guys. Added some to my wish list. Nice. You're welcome, Mark. Next, we have Stephen Michael Hickey, who commented on our unfair AD ABDW expansion to say, this game is crying out for a game changer card that adds panorama scoring and features mm -hmm. to every game with or without the B-Movies deck. Dinosaurs with the electric fences are my favorites, closely followed by Aliens. This is a must-have expansion in my book. It was good to hear your alternate alternate point of view, though. Now, by alternate point of view, what Steven is talking about is the fact that dinosaurs were actually my least favorite of the new uh, things in the deck, actually my least favorite overall, followed by aliens. I think Steven likes more randomness in his games than I do, which is totally cool. And I completely agree that a game changer that adds panorama scoring to every game would be a welcome addition. And though, honestly, easy enough to house rule if you want. Now, there is another expansion coming for Unfair. Perhaps there's a game changer in there. I'm not sure. Um, the new sets are comic book, hacker, kaiju, and ocean. It doesn't look like any of those feature panoramas, at least based on the Kickstarter. I didn't see any cards with the little panorama symbol on the bottom. But there's lots of new stuff in here, including a solo mode game changer. So who knows? Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Just one announcement before we move on. So just a reminder, we're not recording a show next week. And with that, there will be no podcast dropping the following Tuesday. I'm going in for some much needed dental surgery that will have me off my feet for a few days. Here's hoping for a speedy recovery, and I'll be making use of that downtime for some moving action. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Working with you to make your game night better. Tonight's question comes from our most recent Patreon patron, Ron F. from Ron Talks Tabletop. During a recent Sunday brunch show over on YouTube, Ron asked, what are some underused board game themes? Well, thanks for the great question and your patronage, Ron. Both are appreciated. Thanks, Ron. 
So this topic is a great follow-up to our last AMA, our last Ask Me Anything episode, where we ended up spending a large part of that segment talking about themes in board games. Now, that particular talk was focused on theme integration, games that tied themes to the mechanics, and how important theme can be to enjoying games. For those that missed it, that was episode 186, Dog Days AMA and Point Salad Review, if you care to check it out. Now, quickly, we basically pointed out that theme matters and that games that are well tied to their themes can be easier to teach, easier to remember for players, and it can make dry games more interesting. It can broaden the audience for a game. And most importantly, the right theme can make a game more fun. Basically, despite how much we talk about mechanics and how important they are, theme can be just as important which is something I know we get called out on, and I think we're getting better at it, talking about the theme of the games we're reviewing and not just the mechanics in them. Because to me, I would say, like for years, I would have said that I'm much more interested in mechanics and theme. But to be honest, theme does matter. So looking at themes, there are, of course, a number of extremely common themes out there in the board game world. Trains, farming, trading in the Mediterranean, and colonization seem to be ever-present with zombies, Mars, and fantasy falling just a step behind. And Cthulhu. Everything is Cthulhu. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. Ron wants to know about underused mm -hmm. themes, not these super, super popular ones we see all the time, problematic as some of them are. Right, so let's get on to some underused themes that we'd like to see more of. And what we decided to do tonight was do an informal top 10. Each of us picked five themes we'd like to see more of. And none of these are in any specific order. We just started poking and thinking about what we were missing. All right, my first theme I would love to see more of is the insect world. Insects. Yes, there are some out there, right? Mariposas is about monarch butterflies. And I owned a game called Mermies, which was about ant colonies. And while bees is about bees, um, Honey Buzz is about the bees too. So actually there's two bee games at least. And I'm sure there's others, but to me, just not enough. Like, it just seems like such a fantastic theme where you have hive minds and colonies and competing insects or even the things that animals build. Where's a game about building uh, spider webs? Or where's the game about termites trying to destroy a house? Or how about mating dragonflies over the pond? Or something about the study of genetics that uses fruit flies that we all learned about back in grade 10 science. No, to be fair, there is someone in our chat room who has a spider game yes. <laughs> in development. Thank you, Roger Dodger. Uh, but, you know, it could just be that this topic bugs a lot of people. All right. Uh, so my first thought was prison breaks. So who wouldn't want to play out their own Shawshank Redemption arc? Or are maybe you more of a cool hand Luke? Sure, there was a licensed game based on the TV series Prison Break, but that was during a time that licensed games weren't really so much designed as slapped together. Yeah. So lists on this topic I've seen have to really stretch to make the games fit. Because I'm sorry, Monopoly is not a Prison Break game, and yet no. it ends up on the list. That's really, really pushing it. Um, one escape game that I am curious about that I've always wanted to try, it's an older one, is Escape from Colditz. Uh, this is POWs escaping from a prison camp in Germany, though, where I think you're talking more about modern prisons than, than POWs. Yeah, there's actually a number of POW camp escape games. Uh, there's even a licensed Hogan's Heroes game. Huh. Wow. But those aren't especially modern. Uh, Colditz is actually turning 50 next year. Yeah, though it has been updated. There are updated versions of Colditz. I think it's Osprey that does it. So it does look it does not look like a 50-year-old game. Now, my next one is music. Except for some trivia games, there's plenty of those about various different styles of music. And that really weird toyerific game that Hasbro put out a few years ago called Drop Mix, which honestly didn't have much of a game, but you were like remixing songs together. Actually, it looked kind of neat. I actually don't know of very many music games at all. Like, there could be all kinds of opportunities here for music games. Like, how about teaching tools to learn to read music? Or how about a Euro game where you're working together with the other players to compose a symphony? Or maybe you're trying to conduct a symphony or conduct a live show. Maybe even just learning to play specific instruments. Or how about forming a band? 
trying to get the group together or going on tour. There are so many opportunities here for music games, and there are very few out there. Now, Roger in the chat is calling out vinyl, which is one. And I know Sean's waiting for his copy of Rap Gods to show up. So they're, they're out there. There are a couple. But really, there is tons of room, tons of opportunity for music. From playing music to listening to music to bands to touring, so many options there. I don't get it. And music is something everyone understands. Absolutely. And I, I have to say, you know, with my background in actually touring, it would be really interesting to do like a touring manager. You could have competing yeah. managers each trying to get their band more popular by the end of a, you know, touring season. Um, or what about the, the band promoter, right? You're right. all playing scummy promoters trying to rip off your bands or, or you could play like the scummy or not where you like get more money, but you're scummy and you might get fired. Like oh, there's, there's so many opportunities. Yeah. Some real prisoners dilemma in the promotion world. There we go. Uh, and yeah, I, I am definitely waiting on that copy of, of rap gods. We'll uh, see what happens there. Now, another topic that kind of struck me and I started poking around was fashion. Now, there are a couple of really good ones, games about this, including one we'll be reviewing in the future, and we've been talking about in the chat room lately, Preta Porter. Yep. That being said, other than Preta Porter and Rococo, the pickings are shockingly slim, and you rapid, rapidly get into Barbie dress-up games. The fashion industry is a wild and amazing one, with incredible depth and history to it. The fact that it's not well represented in the gaming world is a true fashion crime. So rapid, rapidly getting into Barbie dress up games has just got me giggling here because <laughs> I don't even know exactly what that means, but I've got lots of images in my head. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Um, like personally, yes, I need to get my copy of Predator Porter to the table. Uh, we were playing it, we were getting into it, but then a pile of obligations showed up and I'm like, oh, I bought this one. Let's put this off to the side mm -hmm. so we can we can get the stuff that people are sending us reviewed first. So I do plan to get back to that one. And honestly, I don't know of very many. Like, yeah, Rococo, which you mentioned, um, but there are, I'm sure there are more if you Google it, but like, and again, different styles of games. Like why not the, um, like going down the catwalk game where you have to present the stuff or the behind playing seamstresses or designing clothes. Like when you play Predator Porter, the design, like, yeah, you have different cards for different designs, but how about a game about making patterns? Like, I just think there's lots of opportunities there. Yep. No, absolutely. All right. My next one is hard science. Now, there are lots of sci-fi games out there that are semi-scientific, maybe based on some little bit of scientific fact, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about games based on actual science. And no, not all the random educational games you can get at Scholar's Choice. I want enjoyable, thematic, fun science-based games. Now, there are some examples. Um, I've heard really good things about High Frontier. High Frontier is a game about launching rockets into space that is like a super uber heavy um, brainy GMT game that that like written by astro astrophysicists or something like that, or rocket engineers. Yes, that's out there. Um, Buffalo recently put out Apollo where you're recreating the Apollo missions. And that looks really neat. Um, one I personally own is Kepler 3042. Now, again, this one's science based. So it'd be kind of like the ring world of board games because you're sending out satellites and it's based on actual satellites, but it extrapolates that you would go further. But again, it's based on hard science. I would personally love to see more hard science games that are fun. Like I said, they're, they're out there. I can buy Cytosis, the game about cells, and I can buy multiple um, Professor Noggins games and stuff like that. But I want fun sci-fi games. No, yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, in the same vein, I'm thinking, as opposed to hard science, computer science. So computer hacking, coding. Now, there mm -hmm. are lots of great computer games about this, but there's no reason not to see more board games, especially as a way to develop interest in careers in software and hardware, for that matter. Uh, so many great mechanics are available to support this, but most of the games just end up being more STEM educational, scholar's mm -hmm. choice type games. Or games that reference hacking, but yeah. don't really have any actual connection to the real world of computers. Yes. Um, yeah, by hacking, I don't think you're talking about Android Netrunner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like there's there's some great games on Steam 
where you are, you know, going out and you're trying to break into people's things so that you can make more money and, you know, do stuff like that. And then there just aren't many games like that in the board game world. Yeah, there are some for kids. Like we we reviewed Code Monkeys and then, but those are more, more programming games, not really the hacking. And then there was uh, Robot Turtles. But like it was at such a basic level that they kind of fall into more of those not so fun educational games. <laughs> Now, personally, I do own one game about hacking, but honestly, it's not based on reality. Uh, it's called Resistor. And you're playing two AIs. There's a blue AI and a red AI. And supposedly you're in charge of the nukes. And it's kind of like before games was two computers fighting against each other. But really, it's an abstract game about making connections with two-sided cards. Like, it's it's got a neat theme. Yeah. But it's the only thing I actually own that's really about anything about hacking and coding that's not a kid's game about move forward twice, turn mm -hmm. left, turn right. And actually, that one is interesting, but again, it's it's like one of those no one knows about it games. Yes, I ch I checked on BGG, and it's like you know, there's 15 reviews for it. It's been out for five years. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's 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 uh, unfortunately it was indie published, and I don't think you can get it anymore. Right. It was kickstarted, I think it delivered, and that was about it. Fair. All right, my next one is cooking games. Now, again, there are some examples. There's Kitchen Rush, um, Just Desserts. Behind me, I have Macaron. And while looking at my own games, I realized Tiffin's kind of a cooking game because it's all about delivering lunches around town, though it's more about the, um, I don't know what they're called, unfortunately. It's in India, they have, I think they're called Tiffin's, these Tiffin's that they deliver. But that's pushing a little bit. What I want to see is a Euro game. I want to see a game about coming up with better recipes than my opponent. Or I want a board game version of Iron Chef where you're all competing to please randomized judges dealing with a subset of the ingredients each game. Or how about a game about smoking meats or aging cheeses? There are plenty of wine games out there. There's a couple beer games. Where's the one about, I don't know, I, like I said, aging cheeses or or the, um, oh, what it would, I watched an entire documentary on Parmesan cheese and how it's aged in Italy and that. I think that's a fascinating. I want to see Eno Tool get together <laughs> with uh, Vital Lacerda and do the, the formaggio or something they can call it about aging cheese. I think there are tons of opportunities. I think of playing Shiokadin. Uh, shout out to Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. Uh, his favorite game of all time, one of my favorite parts of the Shiokadin series is they always have this Iron Chef thing going on where you just like collect ingredients throughout the game and then your chefs can battle each other to go up levels. Like I want to see cooking games. There's again, so many opportunities here. Absolutely. And I mean, to me, what, what kind of boggles my mind, I mean, you've got Vinhoff, right? You've got, you know, different uh, wineries all doing their thing mm -hmm. to make wine. How hard would it be to take that rough concept and switch it over to Michelin star restaurants? Yeah. Whoever ends the game with the most Michelin stars wins. I mean, yeah. it, and then, and that's all about, you know, creating the best recipe and hiring the best chefs and the front mm -hmm. house staff. And there's so many intricate aspects, especially when you get into the high end restaurant oh, yeah. that it's very gamifiable. Um, of course you have to, <laughs> you have to understand it all. And you'd need to hire uh, a lot of consultants on that because it's a, again, it's a very deep sort right. of uh, thing. But one thing I noticed, uh, and I didn't break it off into a full topic on its own, but a specific act, a aspect of co cooking I expected to find more games of is barbecue. And yeah, I'm there's... wondering if it's just too niche a North American idea. Maybe. I could totally, like you were talking about Vinhos, and I saw you were going to talk about barbecues, and I was totally thinking something like Vinhos, but with Southern barbecue. Yeah. Where you got, you know, Tennessee style and Texas barbecue and... Like, I, I, again, I watched a lot of food documentaries, surprisingly, on Netflix. It's something I enjoy. <laughs> and I watched this entire series all about going to all these barbecues where they smoke the meat for three days ahead of time and family traditions. And I might like, totally see a game about that. Except that is a very, that specifically is a very American aspect of barbecue. Yes. Even. Like, there's that, that gets really American. But so, then why not? There's, there's other American themed games out there. Yeah. Games about American culture. There's a game about American culture I'd be more interested in than Revolution of 1828. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, my next thought was photography. Now, I know people will tell me about, for instance, Redwood, but that hasn't actually kickstarted yet. The, the, the Kickstarter is still going to be launching, I believe, next month. And it looks okay. fantastic, but it's not around yet. Uh, and while there are a few more like uh, these days, like Snapshot, far too many have the word selfie in the title or intro of the game. And now there's nothing wrong with selfies. 
but there is a wide range of photography concepts out there. And even the mechanics of photography with the exposure triangle mm -hmm. just sort of drip with potential mechanics usable for games about photography. Yeah, when I saw this one, the first one that came to mind is a fairly new game called Picture Perfect, which is all about setting up the perfect shot. But that's it. Yeah. I, now, again, we haven't played Picture Perfect yet, uh, but having read about it, it seems more like it's almost a clue-esque deduction game. And arranging people in items with the photographer is just kind of a that's why you're arranging the items to give it right. some some sort of frame. I actually kind of want to try Picture yeah. Perfect. It's interesting. But I don't know how much photography it would ever feel like. Yeah, it's more of a, a get people in the right place. It's a, it, it could be a home decor game. Yeah, right? exactly. There's, it, I it think... would, it, but it, but of all the, I'm trying to think of picture games. It's honestly the only one I can think of. Do I think Parks there, has an few, aspect of that? There's a few um, wildlife games. A lot of yeah. the, a lot of games these days that are into um, you know nature nature and wildlife preservation tend to focus on a, on a photography theme because frankly right. nature photographers do a lot of good for the environment uh, yeah. and especially letting people know about things but there's a lot more to photography than taking pictures of animals in parks <laughs> yeah so i'd love to see something about like getting the right gear and the right filters and the right lenses and all that that could make for a really in-depth euro really oh god now you're going to start triggering all my uh photography buying <laughs> habits that i finally got rid of <laughs> oh no no enough about that Let's move on to something people take a lot of pictures of. Uh, my next one, actually, is my last one. My last one for today is pets. Yes, I know there's Cat Lady, and now there's a follow-up called Dog Lady. And while Calico is all about building quilts, and if you build them right, the cats come sit on it, there just aren't a lot of games about pets. Like, I want collecting pets. Give me a set collection game about pets or caring for pets. It'd be even cooler where you have so many pets and you have to have so much food in the house. And if you run out of food, the cats, start, the pets start ruining stuff or a vet game. There are a number of doctor games, actually, like, like two years ago or even three, maybe five years ago. We probably could have put hospitals and doctors on this list. And we can't now because that's become a popular theme. I'd love to see a vet one, right? Something like um, clinic, but a, a vet version. Or like maybe even more of a find the perfect pets for different families or a pet training game. Um, you could even get into pet competitions. Like, I again, I like watching documentaries. I watched the whole thing about racing rabbits in the UK that was totally fascinating. And while the usual dog and pony shows, I think are great fodder for a board game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there's a interesting idea uh, I could see of sanctuary or animal rescue uh mm -hmm. as, and again we can really tap into tap into the nature and, and positive aspect of you know you are a nature rescue uh survive you know trying to help animals and you're trying to rescue in, in endangered animals who are you know around the city or out uh and things you know you get you get the call from the person who saw a squirrel that's looking sick you gotta go save the squirrels and things and you know. Or even like you mentioned that, and the first thing that comes to mind is Elizabeth Hargrave's new game, The Fox Experiment, yep. which is all about trying to save a group of foxes and study them and everything. Talking about hard science mixed with pets. There you go. You got two of my themes in that one game. Well, I mean, we, heck, you can go straight into Australia and look at the uh, introduction of non uh, the rabbits and foxes. Um, I'm yeah. sure there. I know there were computer games about that. I played them on the Commodore 64. But I can't yeah. think of any uh, actual board games about it. All right. I, I, we might, you know, when, when you finish, let's talk about a couple others, I think. We, we won't get into detail, but you just mentioned that. And I'm like, I want Simmer at the board game. <laughs> All right. Well, to wrap things up, uh, I picked a really underused theme. Mm. In fact, one I couldn't find any games specifically about. Now, this is a vital aspect of history, a massive shift in power dynamics and life on Earth, one can almost say. And that is the Battle of Menzikert in 1071, the crash of the Byzantine Emperor, and even the Crusades stem from this event. Yet no games? Come on, people. All right, being who I am, when I saw Sean put this in the notes, I'm like, I got to look it up. And there is one. Battle Games Magazine, issue number 24, you will find Manzerkert 1701 from Daniel Johnson. So I'll admit, there doesn't seem to be a standalone game. Though, of course, Osprey has a nice, thick hardcover book if you are looking to find out more about this battle. So I actually went and found a copy of that issue oh, and wow. read through 
And what it is, uh, it's actually a recreationist gamer who went through how they set up the battle and how to set up the battle uh, with enough info so that others, if they want to recreate the battle, they can. But I, I don't know if you can really call that a game. It's more of like a, a sort of like, hey, if you happen to have all this stuff, you <laughs> too can recreate the Battle of Benzikert. Oh, there you go. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's see what else. Uh, what else have we got? So, what, here? what are some? I, know, I just want to throw some out there. The, the, like I said, you mentioned you mentioned uh, the 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 playing games on your computer, and I would love to see a good, like, like I said, Sim Life or Spore from EA. I like yes. There's um, dominant species, which I actually have behind me because you can play insects. Right. Um, but it's like super heavy and complex. I'm like, I want some kind of genetics evolving animals game. Yeah, no, absolutely. I uh, there was the, Sim Earth and Sim Life were fantastic and way ahead of their time. The fact that yeah. they have never come back to uh, existence or been rebuilt or anything Just is weird. I there have to be some licensing issues out there that are stopping it. That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, but no, absolutely. There's a, a bunch of these strange sort of games like that. Um, uh, I mean, the fact that Mule came out as a board game means that there is a drive mm -hmm. for a lot of that old gaming sort of thing. Another one yeah, I was Mule, thinking of uh, uh, was the, the God game that we used to play, where you're actually the God. Populous. Populous. Uh, you know, you know, how many there aren't that many God games that I can think of where you are playing the God of, you know, of over your people and you can choose to be either vengeful or considerate. All right, there we have a couple honorable mentions. I think we'll leave it at that. All right, well, that's it for our list of board game themes we would love to see more of. Mm -hmm. What's a theme you would like to see represented better in board games? Let us know about it in the comments below. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now that you've heard our list of themes, we'd love to see more of. What do you and the lobby folk uh, have to add? You and, and the lobby folk. <laughs> what do you and the lobby have to add? And there's been a lot of chat tonight. Yes, I, I was trying not to call out specific ones. Now there's some great stuff going on in the chat room here tonight. This is why you should join us live, folks. Uh, I'm just trying Instead to find where us. we started. So uh, Mar uh, Roger Dodgers talking about March of the Ants. Yep, I've heard of that uh, one. As for the insects. And of course, Roger is calling himself out <laughs> himself out yes. as the uh, creator of a spider and webbing game. So uh, yes, I, I that, was, that was somewhat intentional. And I didn't <laughs> even know he was going to be here. That's why I specifically called out a game about making spider webs. Uh, he did mention vinyl, which we called out during the show. And then he's tested a few games uh, about music stuff that uh maybe on the way yeah he was pointing out stuff maybe coming soon for yeah. some of these themes so uh ryan is saying he does recall a band management game but so uh, there there is something like rock band or something like that there is one uh, it's a small box card game rock band manager it looks like mm. yes rock band manager is the one i was thinking of I, i'd love to almost love to review that to see how actual how, how realistic it might actually be it was not rated very well mm. uh scalped ticket scalpers i don't know if he's coming up with a new title or if that's an actual game out there yeah uh, i don't know roger yeah rock band manager was part of fancy flight silver line games back in the day so yeah it's, right. it's not a newer one from 2010 right roger saying new that's a new game oh, okay uh, we've got, uh, the new science mentioned, uh, talking about your hard science games from Ryan. Uh, oh, and he's also mentioning science. he hasn't seen the high frontier base game in print for a while. It is. It's, it's out okay. there. Uh, the new science is an older one from 2013 publisher Paris. That actually looks cool. you you basically put forward patents and stuff like that. That looks neat. Interesting. Discover hypotheses, publish papers. That looks heavy. Oh, it's not. It's a 261. Uh, and then when we move on to hacking and computers, Ryan mentions access denied and hacker. Uh, and then Android mainframe is hacker ish. But yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a little more ish. on the ish side, I think, ish. than I was uh, aiming for. Uh, so the latest version is High Frontier for All was published two years ago. 
and it's high frontier simplified for other normal players, but it still has a weight of 4.83. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but yes, High Frontier for All is the fourth edition of High Frontier just published two years ago. Okay, there and, we go. and should be in print everywhere. I'm just checking access denied here on Board Game Geek. Uh, the, the Android Netrunner ones or whatever mainframe is kind of weird. It's you're blocking off paths. Kind of reminds me of um, what is that game? Quartro was that the one where you move forward one or put a wall that we mm. played a bunch of? I can't remember the name of that. Uh, so access denied. At least the only one I'm finding is a print and play uh, contest winner. Um, uh, is that the 2018? Oh no, one or a, the 2021 one. That's or the, the 2018 one. Um, there is a 2022 one, which may be what they're talking about. Uh, two, two, two. Oh, I've got a 2002. That's what I think I meant. Which is a 5.4. Wow, computer car- hacking card game for three to six players. Actually, that could actually be. Despite the fact that it's rated a 5.4, that could actually be interesting, depending on how it's implemented. It looks like one of those um, came in a clamshell, like Ogre. Right. Um, But it actually does sort of remind me of some of the old, uh, like, BBS uh, wall (laughs) door games. Well, it does say you used to be able to play it online. Oh, okay. Maybe it really is then. Workshop. It's no longer available, but... Uh, Hacker, the board game. Yeah. Oh, 1992. There's a lot of them. Uh, 92, 91, 2009, Steve 2001, 1993. Yeah, Steve Jackson. Oh, okay, the Steve, Steve Jackson one, yeah. And then there's Hacker uh, 2, the Ma- dark side. Best modern, modern day board game in 1992. Oh, uh, yeah. There's, there's Hacker Deluxe Edition. Hacker Deluxe Edition uh, from 2001 is, uh, is sort of the newest, It maybe? looks a lot like Illuminati. Probably. I, I wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but that could there be interesting. Go. I'll have to, I'll, I might, might there have you to go. check that one out. There are more hacking games than I would have thought. Here we go. Uh, and then Ron saying, yes, bring on the good cooking and baking games. No, seriously. <laughs> uh, Ron thought up uh, Daily Bread, the bread baking game, just off the top sure. of his head. Uh, Ryan <laughs> thinks there is a cheese game. So in Viticulture, you can build the cheese house, which makes your places better. Right. Um, Don't know about a cheese making game. Uh, and then uh, while you're checking that, Darkling Blight. Oh, there's one called no Cheesonomics. Okay, then there we go. Strategic set collection, a cheesy original card game. Uh, this again, this is quick. Yeah, you're collecting cheeses from around the world. This is not making cheese. This is collecting cheese. Kim Joy Kitchen is a food game. I, okay, I, is it actually a good? <laughs> that, I, that I don't. I'm know. sure there's lots. I'm sure there's a Martha Stewart board game out there too. But oh, yeah. hey, there are a lot of cheese games. Like cheese so as a theme is Kim, not underused. I got Kim Joy's Magic Bakery, which is actually a seven from two th- from 2021. There you go. Um, Race for the cheese, flying cheese, Taco Cat, extra goat cheese. sharp expansion. Cheese, <laughs> please say cheese. Guilds of London, new guilds. Cheeseonomics cheese. has the extra sharp expansion. Oh, there yes. you go. So Chuck E. Cheese Sky Tubes. There's a board game based on the Sky Tubes at Chuck E. Cheese. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. I just okay. Cheese is not an underused theme. My bad. There, yeah, there's so plenty cooking is of, cheese isn't. Yes. Aging cheese. Cooking with cheese is what I was looking for. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just amused by how many just came up. Kim Joy Kitchen. That's cool. Uh, and then uh, moving on to our next topic. Uh, okay, oh, moral. It. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. It's about mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. Mushrooms is, is uh, mushrooms. Yeah, it's like collecting mushrooms. I don't know. It's not really cooking with mushrooms. Mm, fair. I, I avoided food games because, again, then you get into the wine and that. Uh, specifically cooking, like making recipes, combining ingredients. That's what I want. I want I want Euro games about cooking and cooking competitions. And now Ryan called out specifically Hibachi. Came out in 2021 and already has two expansions. Uh, and that so that's that's arguably a barbecue game. I think it's uh, uh, Japanese it's Japanese barbecue. barbecue, but it's still or might be Mon- you know a little bit of that Mongolian concept. But yeah, that's the most true. successful teppanyaki it's... chef in Hibachi. Um. So yeah, that's, uh, that's Hibachi specifically a town in Japan. I believe it is. Yes. Okay. That's <laughs> um. <laughs> um. Of course, it's anthropomorphic animals because of course it is. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> 
Uh, da, da, da. The type of Japanese cuisine. Sorry, I'm just confused. Roger's now. pointing out he misses his dark room. Uh, yeah, I don't have a real dark yeah. room, but I do have daylight dark room uh, equipment, so I can still process. Uh, oh, film. that's cool. Um, uh, let's see. I go only have the pets. Oh, there you go. So you can cook them. So there. Yeah, it's it's at least got cooking elements and moral. There we go. So getting into pets. Uh, Roger brings up dungeon pets. Yeah, Dungeon Pets is is one game, though the uh, fantasy version of pets, but yes. Ryan, Ryan mentions too many poops, and I'm not sure if he's having some uh, difficulties or if that's a game. Uh, <laughs> oh, what's a, there's there's one called Crazy Cat Lady that, that uh, comes with a ton of cat miniatures that Roger, I kind of want. Roger is pointing out in your in your pet game, if you don't feed your cats, they eat you. Um, uh, that, that, that'd be a little dark. But honest. <laughs> Unfortunately, honest. it's pretty honest. Yeah. Um, uh, an adoption a pet adoption game would be great absolutely oh, seriously yeah, yeah. like there's a bunch, here's a bunch of, of families food. here's a bunch of pets and you got to match them up somehow no well, apparently too many poops is an actual game all right okay um uh no there's like again with the sanctuaries the rescues the there's just uh, lots of room uh, the adoption yeah there's a lot of room okay for too good... many poops has the cutest cover on a game oh god well at least i think so this actually looks pretty good <laughs> um i i have to say you know like there's a big thing these days where you want good uh, games that have a good moral message. And yes. and the pet, there is a lot of that available yes, in the pet awesome world. Um, the only thing you have to watch out is whether or not the, the argument of that pets in general are bad as a rule. It, yeah, there's that. But if you want to accept the concept of pet ownership, then mm -hmm. there are some really good themes available within that. And I do mean pets, not zoos. There are plenty of games about zoos. Yep. And circuses. Yep. Both which of which are, are not necessarily the best ways to maintain pets. Uh, and yes, chocolate making game from uh, mentioned from Spitz. Oh, yeah, Chocolatiers. Chocolatiers, yeah. We own that. Yes, Anna yes. made me buy it. Every yep. time we bring up that game, I have to make fun of Dee and say <laughs> she made me buy it and we haven't played it since. There you go. A um, game about making toilets, though. Uh, Roger, when we were talking about uh, the evolution type games, Roger mentioned Devolve, the anti-evolution game. That could be interesting. I, I oh, my Primordial Soup is awesome. That is, there's a game Sean needs to play. It's a fantastic game, but like you don't evolve past like three celled organisms, right? right. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I want more. I don't know. I want a genetic. Someone did a genetics game, I think, about the what are they called? Something Parisi squares? No, that's like the Star Trek thing, isn't it? Right. I don't so know what you like. He's, he's mentioning that the uh, the chocolate making theme is rather weak and could be swapped to anything in chocolate. Oh games. yeah, well yes, that that was my point about it is it is <laughs> the uh, the game about making the the person who taught us the game said it was a game about making toilets. Right. And I'm like, isn't the name of the box Chocolatiers? This is a dude who works for Mayfair Games. Who's like, ah, the theme in this is just dumb. You're just going progressing from step one through eight, and they could be anything. Right. Uh, we did mention Calico. That was actually mentioned when we yeah. were in the actual main discussion. Uh, and then... Uh, oh, Fahrenheit, well, Fahrenheit 451 is one of Roger's theories for a board oh, game. Go. Uh, oh, listening to a Tabletop Bellhop podcast. Who listens to them? Roger's mentioning Satellite Wars. I don't know of a game called Satellite Wars. There's Orbit War or... Uh, well, it's a Kepler 2842. I always forget the 3842. That's actually about launching satellites and trying to get yours in the proper position and stuff like that well orbit war is an actual simulation of satellite warfare in low earth orbit okay um, so uh there are there are games out there about that one um spy satellites oh and roger's got another roger's uh, got lots of theories spy satellites there we go no it's cool i uh, no no problems pritzka yeah i know actually we, uh, feel we free to call it call out any games we, we're happy to encourage orbit um, war is from 1977 wow <laughs> Uh, and then we get into uh, sports management. Yes, we do already have sports management. There, there's a lot uh, of sports management games out there. Yeah, there are a surprising number of sports management games yeah. out there. Which is why it's strange that there aren't that taken to other places, like the yes. like the, the touring management or or whatever. Um, I, I mean, if you want to make... Here, I am going to give out a free idea to the world. I will not demand uh, royalties. Get a K-pop theme like build build your k-pop group and market them and yep. you know and make money off of them just, just boy band the board game doesn't even have to well be boy band, boy band's out k-pop's in so right now okay, sure. right now k-pop <laughs> is hot um and you can absolutely you can make a mint off that the, the k-pop fans are just 
ravenous for material. Uh, and if you get some license, if you get any licensed uh, characters or anything, images or anything like that, they will, you know, even if they never play it, they'll hoard it up. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a number of BTS games out there, but you probably don't want to play any of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I'm thinking <laughs> you could actually make a good game of yeah. K-pop band management or and then yes. re-theme it to boy band management if, if boy bands come back or re-theme it to, you know, whatever when they come back. Spice when they, Girls They, they come back in. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I want to play the Spice Girls expansion for the K-pop game. Because, yeah, I mean, you know, again, these whole band churning manufacturing uh, concepts yes. they just keep happening and they just move to the next cool thing no like blood bowl team manager then you got baseball highlights football highlights then there's the whole fantasy football which is basically a board game um stratomatic like there aren't a lot of sports management games really like when you break them down there's actually probably more food games and there are, there's a cycling manager game like, like but the, a, there are a number pick a of sport them. and there's probably a management a, at least a management game for yeah. it yeah um all right have we gotten to the end of the chat room like we could keep going but yeah no we, <laughs> we finished this segment we finished all the uh, all the earlier discussed during the episode stuff and yes. now we're moving on see roger's just trying to suggest all his games so that right. you know in 10 years <laughs> when he's super famous and everyone's buying his games you heard like, it here you first heard folks. it here first yes there we go because yes i we played uh what was it hockey fight in canada i think is what he called it we tried one of his <laughs> prototypes but not a lot, not not a lot of uh, like CFL themed board games. I bet you there is. I bet you there is. I, I really do. I, like, I, <laughs> I think I can picture one, actually. I think I played one with my dad back in the day. Um, uh, sports Action Canadian, Canadian Canada, Pro there, Football. There, I was close. Sports Action Canadian Pro Football. Cold yeah. Snap Canadian Pro Football. Canadian Football Game. Uh, <laughs> what was the one I was... <sighs> I can't remember now. I can picture it. The board was a football field, and you like actually like bet on different things. Uh, Canadian armchair football. Uh, yeah, I think that <laughs> might have been it. That might have been armchair football. Yeah, I said I remember playing something with my dad because that's actually how I learned the rules to football. Like once he gamified it, it made a lot more sense because just watching football with no one explaining to you, you're like, I don't know. <laughs> they run sometimes. Sometimes they kick. Sometimes whistles get blown. Sometimes when they throw things, it's good, and other times it's bad. Oh, I don't here know you what's go. happening. Gridiron Master from 2007 has two separate versions. You there can you buy go. the NFL in the US. or the CFL version. There. And that's actually a, no, well, it's not a great game, but it's a, a reasonably solid game, yep. I think, for football uh, lovers. My favorite sports management game would still be Blood Bowl. Oh, and not be real sports, but <laughs> most enjoyable game I play. And I'm talking like real game Blood Bowl. I'm all for Blood Bowl team manager, the deck builder, too. But not everyone loves that one. Welcome to our review of Aldabas, Doors of Cartagena, a tableau building game with a unique theme. Thank you, Mark from Grand Gamers Guild, for sending a copy of this game up our way. Now, Aldabas, Doors of Cartagena, which we're just going to be calling Aldabas for the rest of this review, was designed by Nathan, sorry, Nathaniel Levin and Joshua J. Mills. Features artwork from Josh Capel and Juan David Vargas. And it was published just this year by Grand Gamers Guild after a rather successful Kickstarter. So about that, the copy of All of Us we are reviewing tonight is the Kickstarter edition of the game. Mm -hmm. The thing is, currently this is the only edition of the game that is out there. So if you go out and buy a copy right now, say direct from Grand Gamers Guild, or even from an online game store like Game Nerds, this is the version of the game you are getting. Right now, as things stand, there's only one version of Aldabas, but we wanted to call that out and make it clear in case there ever is a retail version re uh, released after this review goes live. Now, Aldabas is a tableau building card game that plays one to four players with games taking well under an hour. Currently, you can grab Aldabas for $29.99 US right from Grand Gamers Guild, an extremely reasonable price. The game Aldabas is based on the real-world city of Cartagena in Colombia, where historically people adorned their doors with elegant door knockers that represent the occupation and social status of the occupants. For example, you will find lions on the doors of people who were in the military. These door knockers are called Aldabas, which is where the game gets its name from. Now, mechanically, Aldabas is a tableau building card game where you will build a 3x4 city block of doors from various occupations. 
Each card has an effect when played and also triggers the cards beside it. At the end of the round, players will add up their influence for each occupation type, and players with the highest and second highest influence in each will score points for a variety of different things based on what's in their tableau, their vault, and their hand. There's also points awarded for banking coins and having the most influence overall. Now for a look at what you get in the box for Aldebus, including the rather striking card art, I invite you to check out our Aldebus unboxing video on YouTube. Or you get to see me get rather confused by the whole Kickstarter and non-Kickstarter thing all over again. Now the most notable thing here is the cards, uh, both how many you get. This is a sizable deck of cards that you will not go through in a single gameplay in most cases. Um, and the composition of the cards. These are some of the thickest card game cards I've ever handled. And honestly, they're actually difficult to shuffle based on how thick and sturdy they are, which honestly is a great sign for their long-term durability, though I wish they were just a touch thinner. Yeah, we played this for the first time on a night with a number of other card games, and it was shocking how thick mm -hmm. and stiff compared to the other decks that we'd already shuffled that night. I'm pretty good at a big, thick, you know, heavy deck riffle shuffle, but it was giving me a workout. Now, along with the cards, you get a thin card vault that also acts as a rule reference, wooden coins, 12 per player, and a punch board with a handful of additional coins, scoring markers, and a two-part dock slash score tracker. Uh, the rules are very clear with lots of examples, and I had no problem with them at all. Note, if there is ever a retail version of, of Aldebus, the coins will be cardboard. Mm -hmm. The other thing we got in our Kickstarter is a small new professions expansion that ex includes 27 new cards in three suits and a two page rule sheet. Now, overall, I was happy with everything that came in the box, except one thing, the vaults. These thin cards just didn't work very well for what they were intended to do, which is to hide cards and coins, especially because the coins in this edition are thick wooden coins. After our first game, I'll admit, I stole some vault screens from another one of my games and used that to hide our information when we played. As for what you need those vaults for, I think it's time to move on to an overview of play. Okay, I'm going to go with the base game rules first, saving the new professions and solo play to talk about after. So you set up the game by placing the dock in the center of the table, the, the two-part thing with the wooden dock side up with coin symbol showing and then create a bank of 12 coins per player. Then you're going to shuffle all the cards and deal everyone a hand of five cards. Players are then going to pick one card to start their block. This is going to be placed face down under their vault, and this is the first thing you're going to be playing. You don't show that to anyone else. Now, all future card plays are going to build off this corner card. Players can then discard any number of the other cards they got from their hand, and if they do, they get one coin for each card discarded. Once everyone's ready, you then flip over cards from the deck until the dock is filled, which is a total of five cards. That's it. This is not a game with long setup time, though I will note picking what card to start with isn't an easy choice and is even more difficult your first play when you don't really know what all these cards do. Yeah, that's very true, unfortunately. There is a lot of iconography in this game, and it's not very clear what everything means until you actually see it and play and use it. Now, thankfully, the vault does have a pretty good reference on the back of it. And what I suggest is for your first few games or possibly all of your games, just play with that side of the vault face up. Now, each turn in all the boss players are going to take two actions, which are chosen from three options. These two actions can be the same or different options. Note two actions. We actually got that wrong when we played early on sitting down to play and that badly impacted our initial mm -hmm. impressions. It's two actions. And that's important for this game to work. Yeah, one of the bellhops rules in effect, your first game of every play is going of any game is going to be extreme no matter how you tried. And this was no exception. So here are the options for those two actions. First, you can take coins, take two coins from the bank. That's it. Note: if the coins run out, you can use the cardboard tokens that are also included. Next, you can buy a card from the docks. You take the card you want, and you pay the cost shown above it. You then slide all the cards down into the market to fill the gap and reveal a new card under the most expensive three coin slot. Note, there are two spots on the dock that don't cost anything. You mm -hmm. don't actually need coins to buy cards. Plus, there are cards you can add to your tableau that can reduce the cost of buying cards. Yep. 
Now, the last action available to you is to play a card from your hand into your tableau, or your growing block. Now, cards must be placed to the right or above existing cards, so you build outward. You also can't place two doors of the same color next to each other. Now, when you do play a card, you are going to activate that card's ability, as well as the abilities of the cards to the side and below the one you just played. Each of the different professions in the game do something unique. And, have, and some professions have cards at different influence levels that each have their own abilities. Mm. There's far too much to deep dive here. Check out the written review for that. But as for some examples, soldier cards let you move coins both into your vault or onto your cards in your tableau as additional influence. Uh, fisheries get you resources like coins and cards. Nobles get you points or enhance your soldiers. Clergy let you vault cards, and builders let you buy cards at a discount. Now, it's learning what these different abilities are and why you would want to do them and how they combo together that's really the meat of this game. And honestly, it's the hardest part of learning how to play all the bus. Honestly, it's a challenge. Even with the vault reference in front of you, there are a lot of things to keep in mind, and I strongly doubt too many groups can avoid messing things up their first several plays. Not because they aren't good players, but because there's just a lot going on. Yeah. Now, play continues around the table with each player taking two actions until one of three things happens. Either the door deck runs out. We've yet to have that happen. The coin supply runs out. That happens often. Or a player fills his block or her block with a 12th card. In this case, every player other than the player that triggered the end gets one more turn. Now we get to scoring which is rather unique and also has a bit of a learning curve. So first off, everyone's going to get two points for every coin they put in their vault. You then take these coins and put them to the rest of your coins considered your purse. Then everyone's going to reveal any cards in their bank, including that first initial card that was put face down, as well as any cards that you then bank later using the clergy uh, profession cards. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Starting with the soldiers and working through each suit, each different profession, everyone's going to add up their total influence of that suit. Now, every card has an influence number um, on the top, and this includes cards in your block and those vaulted. The player with the most and the second most influence on each score, each suit will score points. You know, just like card abilities, the different suits each do something different. Mm -hmm. Soldiers score you points based on how many nobles are in your block. Fisheries score you points for cards left in your hand. Nobles score you points for the coins you've collected. Clergy score points based on total influence over all cards. And builders score you points based on the other building types in your block. Now, after you've gone through all the professions, there's one final three-point bonus for the player who has the total highest influence adding up all their cards in their block. Now, one thing to note here, and this is something else we got wrong at first, is how vaulted cards work. These cards, except for the initial one you place face down, aren't in your block. So they do count for determining the majorities, but they don't count when actually scoring. So, for example, if you have a noble in your vault, it'll count for your having the most nobles. But you don't get the points for having a noble for your soldiers because that noble's not in your block. And this was something else we played incorrectly during our initial plays, so it does seem worth pointing out. At this point, player with the most points wins. Well, at least that's easy to understand. <laughs> now, Aldabas also includes solar, solo play, is that correct? Yeah, it does. And in this case, you're playing against an AI rival. Uh, you start by removing a bunch of coins from the deck and only play with, or sorry, a bunch of cards from the deck. They have a little symbol on them, and you play with only 15 coins. Only four cards go into the market, and then you kind of play your turns as normal, just as we already described. Now, there is a bit of setup for the rival, who will then act every round after you do, drafting a card from the market based on this rather simple formula, and then adding cards to their own tableau once they have three cards in their own supply. Now, card effects are very much simplified for the rival, and in the end, their score doesn't matter at all. All they're really doing is generating influence in the various professions so that you have something to compete against for those majorities. And when playing solo, you have to win. Second place does not score anything at all. Then once you get to the end of the game, there's a little chart in the rules. You compare your score to see how well you did, uh, telling you if you were the saver of Cartagena, if you get over 50 points, I think it is. 
And then there are also some ways, some dials to make it a little easier or harder if you find the AI a little too tough or a little too simple. Sounds like a solid enough solo system. The last thing now we have to cover is the new Professions expansion. I didn't get to try this myself, so how does it add to Aldibus? So the new Professions expansion adds three new card suits, each of which only has one influence level and one new ability to learn. There are bankers that let you steal coins from opponents' vaults and give endgame points for coins on cards, merchants that give you additional coins when you get coins from the bank and give endgame scoring based on the door colors in your block, and doctors, which let you swap cards between your hand and your block or the dock, and just give a flat amount of victory points at game end. When using these new professions, you first have to swap out one of the original professions from the base game. You'll be swapping out all cards at a set influence level. That's nine of them for nine new cards. Mm -hmm. The only restriction is that you can't remove nobles or soldiers. Yeah, those ones seem to be key to the scoring of the game. There would be no reason or no way to vault anything if you start removing all the soldiers. So note, if you remove all of the, the priests, I was clergy, if you remove the clergy, there's no way to bank cards, which can change things. And honestly, that's the big thing about this expansion. It lets you adjust the gameplay in significant ways. In particular of interest to me is if you don't like backstabbing and take that elements in your games, you can pull out the cards that steal things and don't add in the new one, the new banker. Whereas if you do like that, throw both of those cards in and you're going to have a lot more stealing from each other. Now, the only thing I do recommend when playing with this expansion is don't toss in the doctors until you're playing with a group with a firm grasp of the core game, because swapping out cards really messes things up. All right, well, now that we've covered how to play all of us, including the solo rules and the new profession expansion, let's dive into some of our thoughts on this tableau building game. So sticking with the theme of tonight's episode, the first thing I want to call out is the theme of all the bus. I think it's fascinating and works really well as a theme for card suits. Like it just that tied together really well. And because generally the game's pretty abstract otherwise. Most importantly, though, it taught me about something I didn't even know existed. After doing the unboxing and reading the rules for this game, I found myself Googling door knockers of Cartagena and browsing various image galleries and articles about these wondrous creations. Absolutely. I had no idea this was such a photorific place to check out and really piqued my interest as well. Now, moving from the knockers to the doors, I'm not in love with the card design here. Once you played a few games and learned what every profession does and how it works, it's not bad. But there is a lot of iconography here and the clarity on the icons is kind of mixed. Even knowing what the cards do, I did often find myself checking the rules reference on the vault almost every game just to double check and make sure I had it right. And I also found it strange that the most prominent thing on every card is its color. And really, the only reason that matters is for the work, the placement rules, where your cards go. Though that was changed with the expansion, because once you use the merchants, then having the most of a color actually does matter. But up till that point, I was like, why is color so prominent? Yeah, I completely agree here. And it's the one disappointment of the game for me. Things just end up being not as clear or obvious as you'd like, and it makes the learning curve tough, which we know can be a real problem for games these days. Yeah. Now, my next design complaint is the vault. I kind of mentioned this above, but I want to get into it a little bit more here. Because the entire vault design is just weird. You get this thin piece of card that's meant to cover up your starting card. That works, right? That's fine. You're covering one card with another card. You don't, that's, that's not a big deal. Um, but I don't see why you can't just put that card face down on the table and the vault somewhere else. Um, where the vault really falls apart, though, is once you start to put coins underneath it. Now, these wooden coins aren't thin. Like, these are thick. You probably have to stack up two or three cardboard tokens to get the same thickness. And you can't help but lift up your vault once you start putting coins in there. And if you play a really coin-heavy strategy, you basically end up with pillars holding up a roof, as opposed to being something you're hiding from the other players. And similarly, if you bank a bunch of cards, it's going to do the same thing. Your stack of cards is going to lift your vault. It just, it's really awkward. Sadly, I'm not sure how else they would have done it without increasing the cost. Value. Yeah. The coins are the biggest problem, but all in all, it's a rather awkward solution to the vault in general. Now, what I've done is I stole some folded card vaults, literal vault uh, pieces that stand up from another game in my collection. And we now use those every game of all the boss we play. We just place that starting block card face down 
and build off of that. And honestly, this works great. It's way better than stacking things under the included vault card. So I recommend if you can, finding some other solution for the vault. Yeah, so why don't we talk about difficulty? It's currently rated a 2.25 on Board Game Geek, so mid-weight-ish? Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the heavier end of light, heading towards medium, that's for sure. Um, I, I would almost say it should be higher than that, because with the number of different card abilities, various suits, and higher than expected amount of iconography, it's not a simple-to-learn game. Now, mechanically, though, there's only three options, right? So that's pretty simple. But the various effects of cards makes the game heavier than it appears from that simple mechanic. Due to this, I actually recommend your first couple games. Don't try to win. Don't even try. Just just play to find out. Goof around. Play some cards on your tableau and see what they do. Now, the reason I think you should do this is I think it's worth it. I honestly think that learning curve, though a little steep, it's not the worst. I've definitely played heavier games that were harder to learn, but it's just more than you would expect. But once you get through that, once you've got the icons down and most importantly learned what the various cards do and remember what suit's going to score you at the end of the game. I don't know how many times I've now played this game where someone collects all the blue and then they finish the game and they have no cards in their hand. I keep seeing players doing that. And that's obviously someone's missing something because having the most blue scores the points of your cards in your hands. Once you get past that, though, you are going to find a very engaging and I would say rewarding game. It was a push to get to the point of believing in it. But especially with the reasonable price point and portable size, it's worth it to take a few plays and learn it. And I would also recommend everyone double check the rules, because as I mentioned, we got a couple key ones wrong that actually significantly impacted our the way of playing the game. Playing with only one action, all the bus is not what I would consider a good game. Put it up to two and it fixes all my problems. All the Boss is one of those games that honestly gets better the more you play it. It's a game where you initially focus on your initial focus. When you sit down to play, is going to be just trying to complete your block, right? Getting stuff placed and collecting the right colors so you can actually play effectively and just kind of getting what you get along the way. Oh, that gave me some cards. Oh, that let me steal. Neat. That'll eventually shift, though, so that you become get into card counting. When you start realizing there's only nine of every different uh, profession and in those nine there's three of each color and then watching what your opponents are doing um, honestly bluffing about what's in your vault trying to make sure you have the right amount of influence where you need it and so on once you get a group of players to this level this game really shines and what about the expansion honestly i think it's awesome it's not that i love any of the specific professions here it's not like oh i get the swap cards i always wanted to do that it's not that it's the fact that i can use these with the existing ones to tweak the game to fit the people I play with. I game with some people that hate in-game player versus player conflict. When playing with them, I can tweak the deck to make sure there's no take that cards. Another thing I can do is to make the game quicker. I can add in all the cards that give you extra coins and coins from the bank and ways to vault those coins. Doing this makes the coin supply run out quicker, which will lead to shorter games. Plus, you can also do it the other way, where you can make it so that you add in more coins to make the game longer. And what I love about the shorter one is when games end because of coins, usually there's people who haven't finished their blocks, which just makes some really interesting scoring opportunities. I just love the fact that there are dials that I can play with to tweak my game to be a better fit for who I'm playing with. And that's what this expansion adds. So it sounds like if it is ever the case that this expansion is sold separately, it's going to be a must buy. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, if you are listening to this and you have a retail version of all the boss and that's a thing that exists, uh, do what you can to pick up this expansion because it'll let you tweak your game in interesting ways. Overall, while all the boss can be overwhelming at first, and yes, it has a learning curve, it's worth the effort to learn to play. This is a small box card game that gives a strong area majority Euro feel that's become much more enjoyable the more we've been playing it. It also features an awesome mini expansion that's great for tuning the game to better fit your game group and preferences. If you dig Euro games with majority base scoring through influence, you need to check out all the boss. It packs a ton of punch for under an hour. If you dig tableau builders that add a puzzle element in your card placement where you're trying to play cards to trigger other cards to the best effect and optimizing every play, you're going to love the gameplay in all the boss. But if you're looking for a quick, light filler card game, that's not what you're going to find here. 
Aldabas has surprising depth and rewards game mastery and repeated plays. This is most definitely not a one-and-done card game to introduce to your non-gamer friends who happen to like trick-taking games. Well, that's it for our review of Aldabas. It's always nice to find a shorter game that still has a lot of meat to it. Mm -hmm. A filler that can satisfy games, fans of heavier games. So what's your favorite short game that still packs a lot of punch? Tell us about it in the comments below. Now, before we go, I want to invite you to check out my written review of All the Boss over at tabletopbellhop.com. There, I was able to take the time to get into more details about the various card types and what they do, something we didn't really have time for here. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So I got two games to highlight this week, uh, though the first one we just spent an hour or so talking about. Well, I don't think it was quite that long, but still, we, we just spent a whole time talking about all the boss. And that was actually just exploring the new professions expansion. All I want to add here is that I really do appreciate what this adds to the game, though it does feel like the new professions weren't play tested nearly as much as the originals. I don't think this was worth bringing up in the review. But it was one of the things that's noteworthy about all the bosses that not once when we played the core game, did we come up with a single rule question? Yeah, we messed up the rules, but that's mainly due to me trying to read them right before playing the first time and um, not doing the usual where normally Dan and I will sit down and play a game once or twice before I introduce it to others. Uh, we didn't do that. Um, but everything that came up we found an answer in the rules or on the rule reference there wasn't any problems whatsoever i never had to like say go on board game geek or reach out to mark for a clarification now with the expansion content this kind of fell apart our first game tossing in the new cards we started to hit some ambiguities for example when you play a doctor that's a card that lets you swap out a card from your hand with one on your tableau well, what happens if you want to swap out a card that has coins on it as influence? Does the influence carry over to the new card or is it lost? Also with the doctors, what if you don't have any cards in your hand to swap? Can you still play that doctor? Can you put it out on the board? Or bankers stealing coins from vault? Vaults are hidden info. Do you, what if a player has no coins? I play a doctor, I steal a coin from you, and you're like, ha I don't have any. Now, I will say, if you were using the crappy vaults, the flat ones, you'd be able to see if there's coins under there. So maybe that's the one reason you could use the original uh, coins to be able to see it. But that was a question Gwen asked when we were playing. She's like, well, can I ask you how many coins you have? And I'm like, no, because that would give away information you're not supposed to have. Like, can I ask you if you have any coins? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. And that... what if someone says no? Can you then steal from someone else or did you waste your card? Yeah, the vault. The vault and interaction with the vault is probably, for me, some of the more problematic aspects of the game. Um, and it, it, it does lead to confusion, and especially with this profession section. Um, and it also gives uh, some, we've talked about this in the past, and it wasn't worth bringing up in the review, but there is a strategy which, if the other players aren't aware of, can vastly skew scoring. Um, and a good teacher as uh, will teach that the fact that that exists. But uh, we had one instance where there was a complete runaway because yeah. none of us understood about one of the scoring aspects and how powerful it could be. Had we understood that, we could have stopped it, but we didn't. And uh, and that was one. Yeah, of our but we were also aspects. playing with one turn. I don't think we were then. Yeah. We we're still doing one action at that point. Okay. Like we, we've now played this 10 times and I've never seen that happen again. And I've seen people go vault heavy, but, right. and again, if you do think that's a problem, just make sure you include the banker. So you can right. steal things from that player's fault. I, I did not see that come up again. And I'm pretty sure that game when we played, cause it wasn't until Deanna and I were playing that I was like, Oh, you get two actions. That see, was after that. I'm pretty that. sure our first game we did play with two actions. But no, we didn't, because that, that's didn't. why Tori was getting screwed. Okay. Because it was it was only with one action, and that's why he kept losing. He would take two coins, and by the time he got back to him, he didn't have the coins anymore, which is never a problem with two actions. You can always take two coins and spend them in the same turn. Right. That was one of the ways the game was broken before, because he went four turns without being able to do anything, whereas that should have been four turns. He could have at least drafted cards. 
But yeah, the, the overall feel I got from the expansion is it just didn't go through the development that the rest of the cards did. Like, none of it was game-breaking, and I'm sure any group that comes across these could sit down and come up with a ruling pretty easily. Like, we just ruled, we're like, no, if you swap a card that has influence, you lose the influence. It, excuse me, it doesn't make sense that the influence would carry over to a new person living there. And while with, for the vault thing, we basically said, you can say, do you have any, excuse me, do you have any coins in your vault? I apologize for my gastrointestinal problems. Uh, uh, now, next. The, the other game I played this past week was one learning game of Mountains Out of Mole Hills. Uh, this is a new one that the op sent us that has a, it's a programmed movement game with amazing table presence. Like the board on this one uses the box and ends up building a two level play space. Now, the bottom level is underground and it holds your mole standees. Whereas the top is above ground, and that's where you're going to be stacking these rubber cubes representing your molehills. And you move a mole on the bottom and then place a molehill above, uh, putting new ones underneath so everything pushes up. And like talk about theme integration into mechanics and unique themes. You get both with this one. Yeah, and this one, this one stands out. Uh, if you haven't yet, check out the, uh, the unboxing where you can see the built game board. Uh, and it's they... not live yet, so you can't check it out. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, when the when the mole hills game uh, unboxing goes live, check out the uh, yes. check out the the full you know fact that this thing and it uses the box and multiple layers. Really interesting. Yeah, uh, and definitely going to catch attention uh, when you're playing. Yeah, during the unboxing, I actually built the board because I figured people would want to see that, and I even swap cameras so you can see it from the side and stuff. But yeah, that should be going live next week. Uh, it'll be up soon. Um, as for gameplay, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, each round, you draft four movement cards and then stack them in the order you want to take the moves. Uh, this is pretty typical program movement stuff like turn left or right, turn one direction and move as well, or you turn and turn back or move forward one or two or three, depending on the cards. Um, then there's a card that lets you put a rock on the map. And this is kind of fun, the force of chaos thing. Or if a mole hits the rock, you actually roll a die to see which direction your rock goes, or sorry, your mole goes because they bumped it. And there's even a card where your mole peeks up up the top, causing the mole hills to fall. Now in this game, every time you move forward, you're going to raise the mole hills above you, and scoring's based on getting points for every mole hill that has your color on the bottom. And the points are just how many are in that stack. It's pretty simple. Um, there's of course more to it. There's some neat rules for mole hills toppling over, where you're going to add mole hills like the the topple goes in a straight line and adds bricks i'm going to call them bricks i don't know what else to call them hills i guess mounds cubes, <laughs> whatever chunks of rock whatever they are uh two other mole hills and of course those can make other ones topple and there's a whole thing trying to do this whole chain reaction of toppling to make sure that the 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 hills with your that you own are bigger than anyone else's okay now, as for how the game was, I got to start by saying we've only played once and we only played with two players. And of course, we played extreme. The extreme thing we did was pretty simple. It ends up all the cards you play that round are revealed before the first player moves, whereas we were going first player, flip your card, do your thing. Second player, flip your card, do your thing. And honestly, it can matter because some of the cards are multiple. Like you can turn left or right or especially placing a rock. Like if you're planning on doing something and you see I'm about to place a rock, that might change what you're doing. Or if you are the first player and you are placing a rock, you get to see where the second player is about to move, which can be huge. So we did play that wrong. So we did do one, one, one minor extreme play. Um, the game was neat, simple enough to learn. Um, the topple rules are a little bit fiddly. Uh, the placing of rocks is a little weird. Movement rules are dead simple. Um, they're simpler than even Robo Rally because there's no pushing or anything like that. There's no, if you bump into another mole, you stop. You bump into the edge of the map, you stop. If you hit the rock, you stop and you turn randomly. Um, the problem we had was an entire round. Now, this is one sixth of the game. You only play six rounds. We both did nothing. That round, every card that came up was a rock, a mole, which is the peak above, or a turn. Well, it ends up the turn before both of us ended facing in the outer walls. It literally didn't matter what cards we drafted and none of us moved. Now, along with this, it also seemed like the first player had a big advantage, especially when there was only one high-valued movement card that came out. 
Like when there's only one move forward three, the person who gets that move forward three is probably going to have a pretty big advantage. Yeah, that's that does definitely seem like a problem. Is there any um, mechanic to wipe, like to, to scratch? Not, out? not in the rule book. So I, I was thinking that might be a house rule that either if you have no turns or if you have no move forwards, you redraft. I don't know. It's it's not in there. Now remember, we only played two player, and I think that might have been the problem because you put out five cards to draft from per player. And while the more players, the more chance you're going to get a more variety, right? With two players, there's a better chance you're only going to, you're going to get new straights. Plus two player also uses a smaller map. And I'm thinking maybe this one just isn't great with two, like it's playable, but not awesome. Or it's possible as a fluke, though it didn't feel like it. Um, then there's a chance that we're just taking this game too seriously. <laughs> and that's highly possible. Uh, the op doesn't necessarily do heavy games all the time, though they do some. And this is a little toyrific. Maybe this is meant to be highly random, silly fun. And we should have laughed about our moles being stuck spinning around and popping above ground to see where they wall were when a wall was in front of them. At this point, I can't really tell. Like, it's possible this is supposed to be like a brilliant tactical programmed movement abstract strategy game. Or maybe it's just a silly game about moving around some moles, bumping into each other and causing hills to fall. The mechanics and reading it made me think it was the former, which I was looking forward to. But that first game made me worry it's the latter. Yeah, the I, I note that on Board Game Geek, it's listed as a 1.25, which doesn't scream tactical. Tactical <laughs> plan ahead. It seems like it's going to be a little more random than I was expecting. Again, yeah. one play. I We are going to play this more with more players, and I could completely change me my, my mind on this one before the end now one thing i've been playing a lot lately uh unfortunately not physical but uh what we, i've been playing a lot is board game arena which again isn't all that strange for me but it's notable because as well as just not talking about it as much as we have in the past there have been some big new additions mm -hmm. to the game lineup at board game arena that i think are worth noting uh, in most importantly, I think the biggest announcement that possibly no one even expected was today they announced Ticket to Ride. Yeah. I'm shocked by this one just because you can still buy Ticket to Ride on Steam. That's that's what's shocking. I, it doesn't surprise me in the fact that Asmodee bought Board Game Arena and we're going to see more Asmodee games. I'm just surprised that they're putting their big heavy hitters out there when there are Steam versions and other digital versions out there that generally cost more. Well, to be fair, I mean, there is still an edition of um, tile laying uh, Carcassonne. Carcassonne out there. And I'm sorry, but the Steam version of Carcassonne is phenomenal. Like yeah. it is a incredible implementation that blows away the board game arena version. But I can play the board game arena version for free. <laughs> so yeah. uh, oddly enough, I have the version of Carcassonne on Steam and I'm not playing it. Um, but again, it is fantastic. And again, also for solo play, a lot of times you're going to want the Steam version because Board Game Arena generally doesn't have solo play versions of yeah, it's, anything. Yeah, it's for playing with other players. It's for playing with other players. Unless the game has a solo variant. Right. And yes, but yeah, when you're playing a multiplayer game, you can't play against AIs, say, on Board Game Arena. Right. So yeah, that's a big difference, actually. Uh, another big thing that uh, was released not too, uh, reasonably recently was Wingspan. Mm -hmm. uh, that came out. Well, we've got our first game of that that's going on right now, and none of us have actually read the rules, so it's an yeah. interesting experience. I gotta say, it looks great. Like, as far as from what I know of the actual game, it's got everything there. Yeah. Like, even the card drafting has the plastic tray, which is just kind of silly on Board Game Arena, but it's there. Like, someone took the time to create art or scan or something, the actual plastic tray that holds the birds and things like that. Yeah. And the dice tower is there, even though really the dice could be anywhere on the board and let you pick them. Um, definitely try to get the look of the board game going. As for accurate recreation, I'm assuming it's right on. It seems like it based on what I know of the original. But again, I haven't read the rules and it's been kind of interesting flopping around and trying to figure out what we're doing. Uh, I have noted in the uh, the general feed, news feed that they have had a few edge case, I guess, you know, again, I don't know Wingspan that well, but there are a lot of different interactions between cards. Seems like there have been a couple of problems that have popped up and they are doing their best to address all of those. So okay. we'll see. Uh, 
We'll see how that goes. Another one that we've been talking about recently that has just popped up. I don't even believe it's in full uh, release yet, but you can get a hold and play Point Salad on Board Game Arena. Yes, which you want to play real time. Yeah. It's... Point Salad. <laughs> uh, there were, there's a couple of these. I remember Eminent Domain was the one that we were like, oh my God, that game's awesome. It's a great deck building game, but you cannot wait an hour to two days between your turns and know what the hell you're doing. Yeah. Point playing... Salad is like that. This, this is just, it doesn't like, if this was my first experience of Point Salad, I would have never bought the game. Fair. See, I, I'm not, I'm not hating it that much. I definitely see how absolutely a, a live game of it will be better. But uh, I, I, I mean, to me, I don't, it's, it's playing a delayed version of what I had before. So I'm not, yeah. Just dismissing it that much it's just so slow compared to I'm, I'm not saying what, it's, a, it's a great implementation game. and it works and point salad's still a good game but it's just like oh my god like you just don't do enough on your turn yeah. i think that's the problem like is, i felt yeah. more engaged playing seven <laughs> wonders than i do playing this it's almost like playing a uh a non-real-time version of war right yeah so you, you put your card down and you wait and for then your other like come on come yeah, on and then you know the next day he puts their, their, their the other the, the other person plays their card down and you know you're like oh we tied <laughs> we, okay. exactly um it, it, it's it's that kind of, of frustration and yeah. i definitely get that i i'm not hating it it just i it, i expected to enjoy it more i guess oh fair uh and i guess it's been a while now but azul is available on board game arena for that one's really well it. done and it is it's fantastically that, done. that one's great um and i i mean because you had never really played that much on the back side of the card had you no no like a, a handful yeah but now now that uh, because it's so easy to just kind of wipe it all and, and start again without uh, having to set up or shuffle or you know pull do the setup and, and lay out all the different tiles and everything mm -hmm. you know it's it's so much it can be so much faster uh less fiddly and so we've been playing azul on the back side where you get to define your yep. own uh color placement uh regularly and it's been great oh i just noticed something oh now what's on board game arena barrage oh interesting we were just talking about how we should play that we um the other play. one we're playing a ton of is lost ruins of arnak which is amazing on board game arena um though again don't try to learn it on that no. nope nope but we're not don't. we're not gonna bring that up there, there, if you want an interesting conversation there's a conversation going on on the tabletop bellhop discord discord.tabletopbellhop.com about playing and learning games on board game arena and how other people not just us have difficulty doing it yep absolutely um <laughs> tapestry we haven't played in a while deanna is now like playing tournaments of tapestry <laughs> so like she was destroying us before when we played we just now we just let her play in her tournaments she can play over there there you go <laughs> another suggestion i think we gotta try at some point is uh agricola is in there and so is great western trail so those are some ones i would not mind spending more time on there we go all right well uh what about uh what coming up what's uh what do you have planned for the coming weeks all right so cat and tori are back in town uh we're gonna retry mission four and the ghost betwixt on friday i'm really hoping it plays quicker than our last session um maybe we'll have some time to uh, it would be awesome to just get in two sessions actually but I kind of don't want to just play that. So maybe we'll have some time for mountains out of Mole Hill. We'll see. Um, as for mountains, I do plan on bringing that to Brenda's on Sunday and introducing it to the kids. And I'm really curious to see what my kids think of this. Cause like I said, it could be this like brilliant programmed movement version of the Duke kind of two game I'd love, or it could just be this silly fun game and it'll be curious to see how the kids take it. Um, other than that, there's always a chance we'll get to play something else on the weekend, uh, depending on how long those games go. Um, my uh, my my on deck, my game to play next, I think, with the kids is going to be Smash Up Marvel. Or sorry, Disney, not Marvel. I don't know Marvel. Disney. Smash Up Disney is high on my list of stuff to get to the table next. That's one we've unboxed. I read the rules. It's time to play that one. And I really want to play Disney Epic Duels, but I didn't unbox it yet because I was trying to like pace myself <laughs> and like we got to review these. Uh, maybe Deanna and I will sit down and play Belgian Beer Race, which I, which I actually got some insider info on. Part of the reason the board looks so busy is it was designed by a Belgian beer label maker. So it's meant to look like beer labels, okay. which again, you're tying in your theme, but it might be at the expense of gameplay. 
but I'm told they're not that bad once you start playing, which is highly possible. That was a busy board, though. There we go. And I still recommend uh, possibly downloading the English only rule book from Board Game Geek. Uh, it felt oh, more for it, Belgian beer. For race? Belgian beer. It felt more readable to me. So, yeah. Might oh, be. and quick heads up anyone who's listening, you can get Gloomhaven for free on the Epic Store for another go do that for another uh, 12 hours or 11 yeah. hours. Oh, well, yeah. Anyone, <laughs> anyone here live? Yeah. Go, go grab Gloomhaven for free. Come on. Even, even if you don't love it. You at least get to give it a shot. Now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Sean P. Kelly. Thank you, Sean. Derek Hisson. Thanks, Derek. Andrew Dacey. Thank you, Andrew. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. And Diane Tuzano. Thanks always, Mom. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and Ryan's here, so we're going to have to drop that portcullis. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Remember, you can always head over to Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bellhop to tip your bellhops and help us keep the lights on and us on the air. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show for the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast i'm sean and i'm mo thank you and game on